reward. Okay. Uh, let's come to the Lord in prayer. Our Lord and Father, uh, I thank you for this opportunity to speak your word. I ask, Father, that you help me to speak the truth, not my words, but your words. And I commit this particular time into your hands. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, um, the, uh, the, chapter on, uh, the various chapters in Genesis on Joseph actually is very extensive. In fact, there are almost 17 chapters, Genesis 34 to 50, uh, and they talk mainly about Joseph. However, today we will look at two of the personalities involved, two of the brothers. This will involve, so we will, talk, we'll, we'll, we'll consider the faith journeys of Joseph and Judah. Now, there are two main themes in, this, uh, in these passages from chapter, Genesis chapter 34 to 50. One is that the Lord sent Joseph to Egypt to bring about it so that many people should be kept alive. That's the main theme. There's, however, a sub-theme as well. It is a theme of reconciliation between the brothers of Joseph, between him and his brothers. So the lives of Joseph and Judah intersect in important ways to cause this, the saving of the people, to come about. Let us look at the important points. Joseph is the focus of these chapters. He is a man of great faithfulness, has great moral courage. Maybe he is often tempted to sin, but he cares more for his moral purity than for his gain. He kept his integrity despite dreadful circumstances, and the Lord blessed him throughout his time. Judah, on the other hand, leads a life of substantial sinfulness. However, we know that the genealogy of Jesus runs through Judah's line rather than the line of Joseph. Check Matthew chapter 1. In Genesis ch uh, chapter 50, Jacob blessed his children. That we just read. He describes the blessing for each son that each son will receive as suitable, as appropriate to him. Of the 12 children, only Joseph and Judah uh, received great blessings. And indeed, in these blessings, there are also prophecies as well. Only out of Judah will come the line of kings. Let us look at the story of these two. Now, the timeline for Judah is, is, is one of ups and downs. He is not even the... He, he comes from the... Uh, he's a son. He is a son of Leah, uh, of Leah, Rachel's sister. This is Jacob's first wife. Not even the first son. Which is, uh, who is ruined. However, during the process of, in chapter 34, for example, Judah was involved in deception and murder. Their sister Dina uh, were, uh, was, had been raped by a prince of the Shechem Shechemites. Leah's son tricked the Shechemites into getting circumcised, and then they went about killing them and took their property, taking their property. Now, how, what is the relationship with, of these brothers with Joseph? Joseph, being the son of Rachel, uh, was the favorite of Jacob. And there was quite a lot of jealousy between the brothers, between him, uh, or, or from the brothers to him. All right? So, the other sons of Jacob plotted Joseph's death. However, Reuben and Judah tried to deflect this. Judah persuaded them to sell Joseph into slavery. Then they went ahead to their father and lied about him having been killed by an animal. So that is the level at which Judah was operating at the beginning. Now in Genesis 28, it's all about Judah. He married a Canaanite. He had three sons. Ur and Onan being the two oldest. And the Lord put Ur to death because he was, he was quite, uh, quite evil. And 
Ur had a, had a bride by the name of Tamar. Both Ur and Onan face the same fate because they disobeyed the law. So oh, Tamar was left childless. And by the law of leverate marriage, a brother's duty is to provide a son, an offspring for the, death, for the birth, dead brother. But uh, Judah kept his third son from her. And in desperation, she disguised herself as a prostitute and, te and, and, and te tempted Judah to sleep with her. And this resulted in a pregnancy. When Judah learned of it, he condemned her, Im uh, her immorality. Cha Tamar then confronted him with proof that he was responsible. And it was then then he acknowledged that he, she was more righteous than him. He was actually unrighteous because he was not. He did not keep to the obligations of the law of leverage marriage. Now, there's no doubt, you see, you know, looking at the beginning of Judah, deception of the father, selling the brother into slavery, and looking at this point, where the first inklings of his turning point, of the turning point for him, he accepted that he was not uh, righteous. How about Joseph? Joseph was sold into the, uh, slavery. He was first sold to Potiphar, an officer of the Pharaoh. However, right from the beginning, after the first trials of being, um, being sold into slavery, where he actually appealed to his brothers not to do so. But after that, the Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. This is the theme that runs throughout the Bible verses. This is true during his time in jail, after his encounter with Potiphar's wife. But even in jail, whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. In jail, he interpreted the dreams of the Pharaoh, Sir Cupbearer and Baker. He was the only one who could do it, attributing all the time his success to the Lord. Finally, in Genesis 41, we encounter this uh, incident of the Pharaoh, who had a dream that he could not interpret and no one in his court could, uh, could, could do so. And brought, Joseph was remembered. He was brought to, uh, to, to interpret this, these dreams. And he literally told, uh, told uh, Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give the Pharaoh an answer. And he did. Or Joseph was appointed head over, over Egypt as he administered over seven years of plenty and seven years of famine with great wisdom. Uh, in Genesis 42, uh, verses 21-22, we'll soon see, uh, we'll, we'll see an encounter between Joseph and his brothers. There was a famine in the land, in, and Egypt was the only place where there was grain to buy. All right. So, we see that, you know, Joseph saw these brothers approach and he recognized them. Then, of course, he, then he accused them of spying to test their honesty. If you are an honest man, he said, let one of your brothers remain confi uh, uh, confined where you are in, cust where you are in custody. All right. And let the rest go and carry grain for the fam famine for your households. And bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified and you shall not die. Because he accused them of spying, and they denied it. Then it is here, then in, verses, in, in chapter 40, 42, verses 21 to 22, they said to one another, In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother. In that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. This is why the distress, distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered him, Did not I tell you not to sin against this boy? But you did not listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. Now that, 
from the time he was sold until this, time, this stage, it took 20 years. After this period, the brothers began to acknowledge their, what they had done, the sin. And here we get some inkling of how desperate um, Judah felt, uh, Ju uh, uh, Joseph felt. Now, so the instruction was, one of the brothers, brothers was left behind, the rest went, brought uh, grain back to Jacob. But, and then, when they finished the grain, they had to return. The instruction was to bring the youngest son, who was Benjamin, back. But Jacob was reluctant to let Benjamin go back with them. And there were two proposals, brother brothers, to, 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 to tackle this, uh, this problem. Because, of course, you see, Benjamin, being the son of, uh, second son of Rachel, is now the favorite. So Reuben, the eldest, said, here's what I propose. Kill my two sons if I do not bring them back to you. Put them in my hands and I will bring them back to you. Now Jacob, knowing the heart of Reuben, could not do it. In fact, Reuben just simply said, Reuben's the, uh, offer is, based on some other's suffering, not himself. And Judah said, send the boy with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die. And both we and you and also our little ones, I will be a pledge for his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, let me bear the, lie, the, the blame forever. Judah's offer is one of self-sacrifice, obviously. And it is not a surprise that Jacob trusts him. You can see, you see that Judah's faith journey is, has turned quite a bit, as compared even with Reuben. So they return to Egypt. And Jam Benjamin, um, Benjamin, being now the favorite, Jacob's favorite, Jacob, Jacob sets a test, and this test is, uh, will answer the question. Will the brothers now envy and mistreat Benjamin as they did me? So they, put up, they took the grain, they were filled up, and they prepared to depart. However, Joseph screamed to put his silver divin divination cup into Benjamin's sack. And he was caught. They were all stopped at some point and they found the cup in Benjamin's sack. And just, just, Joseph said they can all leave except Benjamin. And this is where Judah again rises to the occasion. Judah, Judah offers himself, and you can see this in uh, verses 44, uh, chapter four, Genesis 44, chapter 32 to 34. Okay. All right. Judah offers himself, if we return without Benjamin, as soon as he sees that boy is not with us, he will die, referring to Jacob. And your servant, means us, will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with, short, with sorrow to show, show. For your servant, Judah, became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, saying, if I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. And here's what Judah says. Okay. Thou, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord. Let the boy go back with his brothers. He offers himself to sacrifice himself to take the place of Benjamin. Now, at this point, you see, Joseph could bear not, could not hold himself back any further. He broke down, and he confessed to his brothers that he was Joseph, the, 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 the brother that he had sold into slavery. And there was a form of reconciliation. Joseph told his brother, uh, told him that. And Jacob, ultimately, you see, 
the story runs runs in this way. Jacob, they try to persuade the whole family now to move, to return, to, to, to settle, to come back to Egypt to settle. Then they, they did. Even the Pharaoh was involved. They sent the wagons and everyone went back. All the brothers went back to, to, uh, to pick up uh, uh, Jacob. Now, in Genesis 49, we will go to Genesis 49. We see, at that point, you see Judah, uh, Joseph, uh, Jacob coming to the end of his life. And Judah, uh, Jacob then will uh, uh, call the whole family together and offered his blessings. They are blessings in a way, but they are also prophecies. And you will see that these prophecies are based, you see, on the character of the, of the children, the, the character that the, the, the sons have already displayed. Their past actions have an effect, as you can see in verse 28 later. All right? Now, you look at, uh, look at the, 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 uh, the blessings for Judah. I will not read, them, read the lines again. But just point out, in verses 8 to 12, Genesis 49, Judah displays qualities of leadership. Judah projects the personal quality, I mean, Jacob projects the personal qualities that Judah has already displayed onto his descendants. He is portrayed as being held in high esteem by his brothers. Nations will bring tribute to him and to one of his descendants. Jacob predicts that the great, uh, predicts the great empire of uh, David and possibly the greater kingdom of Christ. Now, apparently, verse 10 is actually a puzzling uh, verse because it refers, as stated down here, as printed down here, it says, the scepter shall not repart, depart from Judah. But elsewhere, it also says, until Shiloh comes. And that particular verse is interpreted often to refer to the Messiah, the second David himself. Now, let me remind you, Judah has confessed his sins. He has said Tamar was more righteous. Unlike Reuben, who passed the buck by saying, I told you so, in, Judah took responsibility for the safety of Benjamin and offered himself as a hostage in place of Benjamin. Joseph, after his initial uh, trial, at being sold as a slave, had blessings upon blessings. The, he was, there was fruitfulness and great abundance, as you can see in verses, 11, uh, uh, in verses 22 onwards. Most of it material. Though attacked, he remained at, uh, steadfast, verses 22 to 20, uh, 23 to 24. He will be preeminent among his brothers, but not in the same way as Judah. In Genesis 50, we notice that J Jacob died. The brothers became fearful. Okay. In Genesis 50, let's look at verses 19 to 21. All right. When the brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil we did to him. Well, it's very natural. The father was perhaps, you see, viewed as a bulwark, as a barrier against possible retribution by Joseph. Now that he has died, that protection has been removed. That was what the brothers feared. Well, but what does Joseph say? In verses nine, uh, Genesis 50, 19 to 21, Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me. He still uh, uh, takes it. But God took it, meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive and as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Let us consider these statements. Obviously, the three statements together are really the height of faith. 
There's no question about that. Am I in the place of God? He avoids God's chair. He does not take God's place to decide. Leave, leave all the writings of wrongs in God's hand. Okay? And in, in, in the second verse, don't see God, don't look to us in the first word, but to God ultimately. For any problem, do not rely on a particular person as if he would be a savior. Ultimately, only God can do it. See God's providing hand at work, even in the evil acts of men. Take God's view. Okay. And how do you do that? How, does not, how, do, how can one do all these things? You see? And then, of course, you see in, in the third verse, you do not repay evil with evil, but with forgiveness and practical affection. These attitudes are all Christ-like. They are marks of a man whose heart has been changed by grace. This is a person of great character who can live in the world in peace. All right. So how does one God, uh, take God's check? By assuming that we are our own moral authority. Example, keeping a grudge. You judge something who, someone who has wronged you. You think you know what they deserve. You wish something to happen to them. Only God has the knowledge and the power to judge. If you seek to pay back, there's great danger for you. You can become evil yourself by paying evil for evil. With regards to taking God's view, life may be terrible, as it was in the case for, for Joseph for a while, filled with pain. But God is always good, even if it takes a long time before we understand. Trials are meant to bring us nearer to God. In Psalm 119, 71, David says, It was good for, you to, for, for me to be afflicted, so that I might learn your decrees. Romans 8, 28. And we know for those who love God, all things work together for the good, for those who are called according to the purpose. We know Jesus was betrayed. He was given the cup of suffering that came from the Father, actually. God brought good out of it. Jesus is the ultimate example of God making good out of evil. Now, if we realize that, it is an incredible resource. It is something that we draw strength from. Okay. It is truly a revelation from God. Nobody can muck up your life. The Lord will ensure that. Now, in the third part, repay evil not only with forgiveness, but with practical affection. Joseph images God's love by loving his enemies. Joseph knew God loved him, has taken care of him, although he did not deserve it. At the beginning, he was actually a spoiled brat. God had blessed him greatly. He was a great man of great faith. Now let's look at Judah. Exactly. We find him more relatable, don't we? He's, he easily makes mistakes, especially trying to look good on the outside, when inside it's not so. At the beginning, he was unspeakably sinful. By the time he encountered Tamar, there was some hint of his turnaround, his acknowledgement of unrighteousness. When he, meets, he met Joseph again, he must have grown adequately in faith for Jacob to trust him not Reuben, with Benjamin. Finally, he offered himself as a sacrifice to replace Benjamin for the love of his father. And this enhanced his standing as, he seen, as seen in Jacob's prophecy concerning him. Recall in verse 50, 28, the blessings suitable appropriate to him. Now, in connection with, you, with this, let me just tell you about um, verse, uh, verses 3 uh, 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 chapter uh, uh, read verses three, 3 to 5 for Reuben. 
For Reuben, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 50, verses 3 to 5, Reuben, you are my first, firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power, turbulent as the waters. You will no longer excel, for you went onto your father's bed, onto my couch and defiled it. The one principle we should take, get out of this is that our actions today matter. They will have consequences, sometimes even far into the future. And in the case of Judah, all the way up to the coming of the, of the Messiah. So, from the time of selling his brother, where he displayed total disgust for his father, from a person who couldn't care less, right? It took to the point where he actually offered himself as a sacrifice. It took 25 years. This, the Lord is clearly patient. This should encourage us. Judah did respond, although slave, uh, slowly. It was a struggle of selflessness against selfishness. The Lord looks at the heart. Look at the parable of the, of the woman with the two coins. This is in, this is in, um, in Mark 12, 41 to 44. Mark 12, chapter 12, 41 to 44. Do you have it? The last slide, please. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched his people. Uh, this, is, this is the widow and his offering. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the prophet putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came in and put in two small copper coins, which, made a, which make a penny. And Jesus called his disciples to him and said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, and she, out of poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live in. The Lord looks at our heart. No question about that. It's wonderful to have plenty and to be able to give out of plenty. There is nothing wrong in that. But the person who gives out of the heart gives out of, very often gives his, his or her all. Okay. One can give out of plenty. In this case, I would refer to Joseph. Or sacrificially, like Judah. Judah's step journey was in little steps of faith. He responded to his trials positively, step by step. One step of growth, giving rise to the next, next step of growth. Love and... Um, Love of uh, the heart and love of working together. The heart and the head working together. The head committing, the heart responding. And ultimately, the little steps, the cumulative sum is great, as you can see in the, in the case of Judah. And we see that he offered something which pointed out, pointed to the ultimate sacrifice, that of Christ himself. Okay. All right. Now here's a concluding thought. The faith journeys of Joseph and Judah contain ample lessons for our walk with the, with the Lord. Just as he was present in their lives in ways big and small, he continues to act in ours today. Let us repent of our sins, wait patiently upon him to right all wrongs, and yield to his hand to make us a true blessing to others. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Lord and Father, we thank you for loving us despite our shortcomings. And sometimes we are horrible. We just ask, Lord, you help us, strengthen us so that our love for you will come out from our heart and also from our head. Have mercy upon us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Let's rise and respond with the 